Chapter 9 After breakfast, Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Zimer went out on the front porch to make plans. Dr. Zimer beckoned me to come with him, but Dr. Kennedy didn't pay any attention to me at all. I agree with you, of course, Zimer, Dr. Kennedy said, stretching out in the old wicker chair and crossing his long legs. We've got to release some sort of story to the press about this remarkable animal. We could call the museum in Washington and give them all the details, and they can pass it on to the Associated Press and the other news services. Of course, the radio will pick it up right away, and it will be all over the country in no time. And then the excitement begins, Dr. Zimer said. Yes, exactly. Now, my point is this. I think we should have this animal safely tucked away in the National Museum before we begin to spread the news. It's too valuable to take any chances with it. Why, it's the most important living specimen in the whole world. We should put it in air-conditioned, thermostatically controlled, constant humidity glass compartment and keep the animal away from drafts, germs, insects, crowds, and sudden changes of temperature. We wouldn't want to have crowds of people climbing all over us before we have a chance to crate the thing up and get it down to Washington. You know what a nuisance that can be. That gave me a jolt. Were they going to take Uncle Beasley right off like that? I hadn't expected that to happen, but Dr. Zimer looked over at me and winked. Hold on a minute, Kennedy, he said. Have we asked the owner about this? Maybe he has other plans for his dinosaur. The owner? What do you mean? Well, this dinosaur happens to belong to Nate Twitchell. Perhaps he doesn't want this dinosaur to go off to a museum. He may even want to keep it himself. Kennedy sat up suddenly. Well, he'll sell it, won't he? He turned to me. How about it, boy? We can give you a hundred dollars for your animal, right as it stands. You wouldn't want to turn down an offer like that, would you? How about it? A hundred dollars? That was an awful lot for one little dinosaur. But I'd only had him for one day now. And I didn't want to have him go off to a museum and perhaps never have a chance to see him or anything. It just didn't seem right to sell him like that. I shook my head. No thanks, I said. I don't think I'd better sell him. Well, a hundred and fifty dollars then. How about that? I shook my head again. Dr. Kennedy sort of tightened up his mouth and he turned to Dr. Zimer. What's the matter with the boy anyway? Are all New Hampshire people as stubborn as that? Dr. Zimer smiled. They're not stubborn, Kennedy. They just like to do things their own way. It is very admirable quality. Dr. Kennedy was frowning. Now look here, boy. This is an important matter. This dinosaur is extremely valuable to science. We've never had anything like it, and we may never again. But what is it to you? It's just a big lizard. It wouldn't make a good pet. It would be hard to feed and take care of. It couldn't stand cold weather. It would be just a nuisance to you. It wouldn't mean anything to a boy your age. Why don't you let us have it? But but he's mine, I said. He's kind of a, well, kind of a friend. I wouldn't want to sell him. Kennedy got up and began walking up and down the porch, waving his long arms. Don't you see what it means? Scientists all over would give anything to be able to study this dinosaur. You wouldn't want to stand in the way of science, would you? Well, no, I said. But can't the scientists come here and study him? I don't mind if they study him as long as I can keep him. Dr. Zimmer, Zimer grinned at me. I guess you'd better give it up, Kennedy. The scientists will just have to come up here to freedom, whether they like it or not. But good grief, Zimer, where are they going to stay? There just aren't any accommodations here. No hotel, no restaurant, no inn. Do you expect them to camp out in the street? Well, it's a nice, quiet street, Dr. Zimer said. Besides, I don't recall hearing of any hotels in the Gobi Desert or at the Wyoming Fossil Beds. Now, let's get that telegram off to the museum. Can I say that we agree that it appears to be a triceratops? 
Well, I suppose so, Kennedy said. I left them writing their telegram and went out to get some more grass for Uncle Beasley. If it was going to grow that fast, I'd have to really get going on the grass supply. Pretty early in the afternoon, Cynthia got a telephone call from the Natural History Museum in New York. They wanted to know about the dinosaur bones that had been just discovered up in Freedom, New Hampshire. Dr. Zimer straightened them out on that, and they said some men would come up right away to have a look. A few minutes later, the New York Herald Tribune called about the fossils, and then there was just a steady stream of calls from all over the place. And during supper, a reporter from Laconia dropped in, and a college professor came over from his summer place on Sebago Lake. People were standing around asking all kinds of questions, and the telephone was ringing just about all the time. And then when we listened to the news on the radio, we heard a deep voice saying, and the strangest news tonight, folks, comes from the little village of Freedom, New Hampshire, where they claim a dinosaur has hatched out of a hen's egg at the home of Mr. Walter Twitchell. Two scientists from the National Museum in Washington have examined the animal and report that the best of their knowledge, it is a healthy specimen of Triceratops, a dinosaur that became extinct some 60 million years ago. So far, the two scientists have offered no explanation for the fact that this ancient reptile has hatched from a hen's egg. Now, folks, when it comes to soap, the first thing that we look for is we turned off the radio and went back to answering the telephone. It sounded funny to hear our own name coming right over the radio, just as if it was some other family that we'd never heard of. After the news broadcast, the telephone calls began coming thick and fast, and Cynthia really had her hands full. She was having fun, though, and I had to wipe dishes in her place, so I didn't pity her too much. There were calls from all over the place. There was one from Booth Bay and another from Prout's Neck, wherever that is, and then one came from a professor somebody, some professor somebody over at Dartsmouth College, and from the animal farm down in Nassau and the Boston Museum of Science, and I don't know where all. It kept on all evening, and finally Pop told Mrs. Beebe, the telephone operator, that we were all going to bed and not to ring our, our number any more until morning. The next morning, I did my chores as quick as I could. I almost forgot old Ezekiel down in the cellar. There was so much going on. I fed the chickens and milked the goat and got a big armful of grass for Uncle Beasley. He looked even bigger than before, and his legs were getting stronger. I figured he'd be out of that pen again pretty soon if we didn't make it tighter. We hadn't hardly started breakfast when the phone rang. It was a newsreel outfit down in Concord that wanted to come up and make some pictures. Then a television man made an appointment for the next day. Pop started in on a big article for the Freedom Sentinel about the dinosaur, and he had me write a piece on how it feels to own a dinosaur. Later, he got Dr. Zimer to write out some of the scientific things about it. Dinosaur news filled up about half the front page, and Pop ran off a lot of extra copies of the newspaper. Well, Pop said, I guess the town of Freedom's back on the map again. It's the first time anybody's heard of us since back in 1932 when we had the eclipse up here. We'd better make the most of it while we can. Even a dinosaur won't make us famous for long. Nate, you better take about 50 copies of the paper over to the grocery store, and we can put some on a table in front of the house. Pretty soon, some of the neighbors began to drift in to look at the dinosaur. Mrs. Parsons looked at it and kind of shuddered. Joe Chimpigny's father just stared and shook his head. Mrs. Dunn brought her two children over to see the funny animal, and then she went into the house to talk to Mom, and I had to keep stopping them from throwing stones at Uncle Be Beasley. They're only little kids, but they sure can be a nuisance. Dr. Zimer and Dr. Kennedy came over, and right after that, the newsreel truck drove up. The men got out of a lot of equipment and cameras and stuff and dragged wires all over the place. 
They took pictures of the house and had me pick up Uncle Beasley and feed him some grass. And I had to say something into the microphone about how I first saw him after he hatched out. And then Dr. Zymer had to make a sort of speech about what kind of animal it was and what a big thing this was for science and so on and so on. We all got pretty tired of being told to stand here and stand there and do this and do that. We were glad when the newsreel truck left. And then came the reporters. There were an awful lot of them, and they kept coming in two or three at a time, and they took all kinds of pictures, and they all asked the same questions about how old I was, and was I surprised to find a dinosaur come out of a hen's egg, and they talked all the time with cigarettes dangling out of the corner of their mouths. By that time, there was getting to be quite a crowd, especially out in the backyard. Dr. Zimer and I stood right close to Uncle Beasley's pen so nobody would come along and hurt him. I don't know why it is, but whenever people see an animal in a cage or someplace where they can reach him, they always want to poke him or throw things at him or bother him in some way. I guess it must be a kind of instinct or something. The scientists began arriving soon after that. There were all shapes and sizes of them. Some of them were tall and skinny and smoked big pipes, and others were short and had horn-rimmed glasses. They gathered in little circles and started jabbering away about Mesozoic and Cretaceous and Protoceratops and Atavism and all sorts of words that were way over my head. And then, the way they would argue, it was really something Every one of them had a different theory, I guess, and each one was trying to talk louder and faster than the next man to prove that his theory was right and the others were all wrong. It made quite a racket, even worse than our sixth grade when Miss Watkins leaves the room. Dr. Zimmer was busy shaking hands with old friends and I could see Dr. Kennedy's head above the crowd. He was frowning and muttering things to himself like, place is a madhouse. Bedlam, no order at all, completely unscientific, ought to be in a well-regulated museum, and things like that. I went to get another armful of grass, and I fed it to Uncle Beasley, and all the scientists crowded around and watched him eat. And, of course, they all had to argue about that. Someone said something about mandibles, and they had to thrash that all out. And then there was a hot argument about three-root molars, and it went on that way for the longest kind of a time. As far as I could see, Uncle Beasley was just eating, but they wouldn't let it go at that. Scientists really sound pretty funny when you listen to them talk that way. When evening came and it got dark, we sort of shooed everyone out so we could go in and have supper. It was pretty late and Mom wasn't too pleased about having to keep supper so long for us. The idea, she said, supper at almost eight o'clock? I don't see why everyone has to get in such a state over a little animal like that, even if it is a dinosaur. You think the world was coming to an end. But it is very important to the scientific world, I said. Oh, you and your scientific world, Mom said. I should think the scientific world would know when it was time to go home for supper instead of hanging around to all hours and making people late for their meals. I don't think Mom could ever see what was so important about dinosaurs.